David Maida is uh, actually Jewish, and he's, uh, he's been a student of the Holocaust, and he's done an enormous amount of work on that. In fact, he's on the Raoul Wallenberg uh, uh, Investigation Committee. We're both actually from the same city in Canada. We actually knew each other when we were very young, 16 or 17, at, at university together, and we've both been interested in human dignity for all our lives, really. My mother and father were lucky enough that they could have uh, caregivers in our home in the late 40s and 50s who had come from places like Poland and uh, other countries where the Russian Soviet Union had been and had done terrible things to people. And so these wonderful women w would tell me what had happened to their family or their cousins and, and at the hands of the Russians. So I, I think I learned about communism when I was maybe six or seven or eight years old. And, uh, and so uh, I had a sort of inner understanding of it. And so when I heard, learned what the Communist Party was doing in China, it was not a, it sort of brought back memories of what the Russians did to uh, people in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. People I had known and loved, they were, they were dear, dear, dear friends. So I, I guess it may have started there. And over the years I've known people from Rwanda, friends from Rwanda, people from uh, Ukraine, a lot of countries that have been uh, treated ab abominably by, uh, by totalitarian regimes, whether Nazi or, or, uh, or communist. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're virtually the same. The, the, the Nazis and the communists had, uh, the, yes, there were differences, of course, but uh, the methods were the same and are the same today. The totalitarian governments of any stripe think that people have no dignity, they have no value, and that they can do anything they want to them. And uh, uh, I sometimes worry that human life in China today has the no value whatsoever. And when you, and when you see what's happening to the Falun Gong practitioners, you, uh, you, you would have to think that's true. We were asked to, uh, to investigate by the coalition to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong. And uh, two of us agreed to do it independently. and. Uh, when we both learned the other was going to be doing it, I think we were both delighted. We've been doing it. We've been adding to our knowledge for seven years, and I think, I think uh, initially on our first report we did it after four or five months, and we were convinced that the allegations were true that that the uh, Falun Gong community were being killed for their organs, and their organs were being sold to to organ tourists from abroad and and to wealthy Chinese. And then we did a follow-up report. And then I guess we did the book in 2009. And by that point, we had received so much evidence that we had no doubt whatsoever in our minds that, it, that it, this, uh, we call a new crime against humanity or a new form of evil in the world was going on. And, uh, and the people would say, even I even heard this on this trip, that well, we need more evidence. Well, I think if you look at it, we have 52 kinds of evidence. Mm -hmm. And for some people, we'll never have enough evidence. But if we had 152, they'd say, oh, we need more evidence. But for fair-minded people in governments and parliamentarians and so on and journalists, I don't think there's any doubt that the, the case has been proven. The fact that the government of China is now talking about uh, stopping uh, organ transplants uh, from prisoners, of course, they never mention Falun Gong prisoners. They always talk about prisoners who are subject to capital punishment. Wang Jiafu, for example, the former deputy minister of health, always talks about about uh, convicted criminals. And I've never heard the word Falun Gong come out of his mouth. He's admitted, for example, that he uh, did uh, two liver transplants for, uh, I think, since 1989, every week. And now he's involved with this new do donation program. And uh, I hope it works. I hope they do stop using organs from all prisoners. But uh, since it's so profitable and, and, and uh, they've been doing it for so long, I think it's going to take more even more pressure from the world community. And I think we're at the p tipping point where, where we're finding that talking to parliamentarians in Asia and in North America and Europe, I think we're at the point now where parliamentarians are going to pass laws that say it's, uh, if you buy a trafficked organ, uh, uh, b pay for an organ, that's an offense. And uh, uh, New South Wales is talking about this in um, Australia. We've been to the Irish parliament and I think they're looking at this sympathetically. I was in the British parliament last week so, and now, of course, in Sweden, I, I hope that parliamentarian, parliaments will pass laws like this right across the world. We're going to keep going until this stops, along with thousands and thousands, if not millions of other people, until the, 
the pillaging of organs of Falun Gong stops in China. We are going to keep going. We're going to last longer than, than the party state in China. When they stop, we will stop.